At number 10, we have Baphomet. Although he was actually just on a mount of Pia in disguise, it was still a moment of betrayal that took Batman by surprise. Baphomet appeared to be a young, up and coming vigilante superhero who appeared numerous times to help Batman, one time helping him defeat the Black Spider. He showed face so many times, in fact, that Batman started to trust him and eventually gave him his blessing to start fighting crime in Gotham. Batman even had Baphomet fill in for him while he was on vacation in Aspen with his fiance. And Automatopoeia as Baphomet was really playing the long game. He even caught Mr. Freeze and single handedly stopped the Joker. So Batman really started to confide in him, even bringing him to the Batcave one day after a real heart to heart moment. In this instance, Batman even goes as far as taking off his own mask in front of Baphomet, who promptly reveals his true identity as Automatopoeia and slits Silver St. Cloud's throat, who is Batman's fiance. Of course, at this point, Batman knows that he messed up big time, but how could he have known? This dude played the long game with a sad outcome for Batman, of course. At number nine, we have Zatanna. This is another pretty sad one, but then again, that's sort of the theme of this whole list, right? Zatanna, a powerful superhero who has control over magic, is a longtime love interest for Batman. And in one storyline known as the Mind Wipe storyline, Zatanna is caught wiping Dr. Light's memory and also trying to change his personality to be less evil. But when Batman walks in on this happening, she also wipes part of his mind as well. Of course, Batman doesn't realize this since his memory had just been wiped, but the Justice League has to come together and confess to Batman what had happened. This crushes Bruce, causing him to naturally develop some pretty serious trust issues and create Brother Eye, an intelligence system that orbits Earth to keep an eye on superheroes that may betray him in the future, which leads to more sad discoveries down the road for the Dark Knight. Okay, at number eight, we have Catwoman. I know, she definitely isn't considered a villain to Batman either. In most cases, as we all know, Batman is usually romantically associated with Catwoman. And going into the Nolan verse, there's an instance in The Dark Knight Rises when Batman's trust for Catwoman is strong enough that she actually leads him into a trap set by Bane. In one of the closest calls we see Batman ever face, comics or movies to facing death. This just proves that Catwoman really can't be trusted no matter how influential or appealing she is to Batman. She will always put herself first, and that's something we can basically confirm after seeing this. Luckily, at the end of this event, when Catwoman sees how hard Bane beats up Batman, she gains sympathy, leading to a change of heart. But it was sort of too late at that point. At number seven, we've got Alfred. Not a superhero in the state we all know him as, but why he belongs on this list is that in one storyline, he's actually given superpowers. And if his intentions had remained heroic, Alfred would have been a superhero by nature, but on Earth-1, while Batman is away, Alfred decides to track down a criminal organization that Batman had been monitoring. But he's captured, and when Batman and Robin come to save him, he sacrifices himself by walking into a trap set by the bad guys before they could. On the brink of death, Alfred is revived by a physicist named Brandon Crawford, who uses a radiation treatment to revive him. Unfortunately, this instead turns him into the Outsider, giving him superpowers and leading him into an angry rage towards Batman. Thanks a lot, Brandon. You had one job. Anyway, when the Outsider targets Batman's allies, Man Bat, Batgirl, and Robin, they get the best of him, tearing the evil Outsider out of Alfred's body and leaving him vulnerable. And Alfred, in all his heroic glory, lays the last blow, taking out the Outsider for good. It's nice to have you back, Alfred, but uh, maybe just stay put in the Batcave from now on. Number six, we have Stephanie Brown. When Stephanie is Batman's Robin, she betrays him as well. Sort of. It was an accident but a betrayal nonetheless. When Batman seemingly dismisses her abilities to be an adequate Robin, she sort of pushes him to train her, which he finally does. But when she disobeys him twice in combat, Batman is forced to retire her because he feels he just can't trust her. Feeling isolated, she goes off on her own to try and prove her worth. She gets a hold of one of his long-term plans to deal with the criminal underworld of Gotham. But due to her missing one key detail, which the plan was predicated on, it all spins out of control and causes a citywide gang war, resulting in the Batman War Games storyline. She is then captured by Black Mask and tortured for information about Batman. She escapes, but later succumbs to her injuries in the hospital with Batman by her bedside. A very sad end to a potential superhero who just wanted to be accepted, but instead betrayed the very man she was trying to impress. At number five, there's Jason Todd. Jason, who used to work alongside Batman as Robin, 
turns on him and teams up with the Riddler and Hush, another character who betrays Batman. We'll talk about that later. What happens is that Batman thinks Jason was killed by the Joker. And after a while of accepting this as fact, Batman is completely caught off guard by the return of his old partner, but this time with ill intentions for Bruce Wayne. So it turns out he actually is killed by the Joker, but after Superman Prime alters reality, Jason is revived. Sort of. He falls into a coma for a year and is taken by Talia al Ghul to a Lazarus pit to restore his powers. But when he reemerges, he isn't himself and is influenced by Talia to confront Batman, wondering how the Joker hadn't been killed to avenge his death. When Batman doesn't show remorse that he spared the Joker's life, Jason is enraged and takes on the mantle of Red Hood. He then does some nasty stuff like leading multiple criminal gangs in Gotham, sharing Batman's identity with Hush and the Riddler, and other villainous things which would be detrimental to Batman's ability to keep the streets of Gotham adequately protected. At number four, we have Azrael, or John Paul Valley, in the Batman Nightfall story arc. A staunch supporter of Bruce Wayne, John Paul Valley is placed in charge of the Batman alias as Bruce Wayne is facing burnout due to run ins with Bane. But while Azrael is wearing the mask and cape, he actually starts to inflict too much violence on the criminals of Gotham, going against the reputation that Bruce had taken so long to develop. Azrael even goes as far as distancing himself from Robin, believing that Robin isn't enforcing enough violence on the criminals of Gotham, seeing this as the only way to restore peace. Commissioner Gordon's trust towards Batman also takes a hit from John Paul's instability, because of course, no one is informed that this new Batman isn't in fact Bruce Wayne. It's another devastating betrayal of Bruce Wayne's trust because when Bruce needed him most, a close confidant not only betrays his wishes and his reputation, but also gets carried away with his influence over Gotham, at one point leaving a captured civilian to die, along with serial Avatar, who had been the captor. Just a flat out betrayal all across the board. Okay, at number three we have Thomas Elliot, otherwise known as Hush. Thomas was a childhood friend of Bruce Wayne who had the ability to become a superhero, but instead went supervillain, taking a stance against Batman and everything he does. What happens is that Thomas Elliot turns bad and decides to try and kill his parents for their fortunes. But Thomas Wayne, Bruce's father, actually keeps his mother alive due to his advanced surgical skills, which angers Thomas, who turns on Bruce in a bitter turn to resentment. He starts referring to himself as Hush, a masked villain covered in bandages set out to defeat Batman. And he gets pretty close too, teaming up with the Riddler, the Joker, Poison Ivy, and Killer Croc in an elaborate plan to take down Bruce Wayne altogether. So yes, I know what you're thinking. He's not really a superhero, but deserves a spot high on this list because he could have been. This guy had dealt with a tougher upbringing than Bruce, his dad being an abusive alcoholic and his mother never protecting him adequately, so he had a harder time following the path of good that Bruce had led. But when they would play together as kids, Thomas would often outmaneuver Bruce, proving that had he pushed through his trauma and gone down a path of good like Bruce, he could have been a superhero that might have even contended with Batman's abilities. And I just had to put him on the list of times Batman was betrayed because what hurts more than a longtime friend betraying you, you know what I mean? Actually, I hope you don't know what I mean. Let's keep it at that. At number two, we take a look at the Injustice storyline when Superman betrays his otherwise longtime friend Bruce Wayne, along with some other superheroes as well. In a storyline explored both in the comics and in the video games, Superman is tricked into killing a pregnant Lois Lane under the influence of that the Joker gives him. As a result, Superman goes against his core values and kills the Joker. This throws him into a spiral, as he also turns on other members of the Justice League who he once called teammates, including Batman. When Batman notices that Superman's reign of terror has turned into an authoritarian regime, he sets out to stop him. So what does the once heroic Superman do? He reveals Batman's true identity to the world and recruits Bruce's own son, Damien, to fight against him and the Justice League alongside him. Ouch. This brings us to number one, Damien Wayne, Bruce Wayne's own son. This is a sad and a brutal betrayal, which is why it belongs at number one for me. Having been brought up by his mother, Talia al Ghul, and trained as an assassin from a young age, Damien is an aggressive and unagreeable young man who doesn't like to follow rules, especially those set by his father, who he feels is too easy on the criminals and isn't allowing him to thrive as the trained assassin that he is. Sound familiar? So when the opportunity arises, Damian Wayne joins up with Superman, who as we've just previously explored, had just adopted all those values that Damian desired. 
So in a selfish and naive move to serve his own needs to kill, Damian Wayne, the former Robin, betrays his own father and helps to take on the entire Justice League as a force of evil. Just like many supervillains, his motivations are pretty deep seated and it's pretty obvious that he'd always wanted to serve alongside his father. But this just proves that just like Hush, a powerful being's upbringing can make a huge impact on the brutal path they choose. I'm sure if Bruce Wayne had known that he had a son in the first place and it hadn't been sprung on him by Talia so late into Damian's adolescence, the boy could have been saved from these dark ways, which led to his betrayal. Brutal. Number 10, Captain America. Or a version of Captain America, at least. This version of Captain America betrayed a whole bunch of superheroes and pretty much all of the civilians of the United States of America. That's right, we're talking about Hydra Cap, who technically now is an alternate, but at the time of reveal, was sold as being a longtime sleeper agent of Hydra in the main continuity, changing pretty much everything we thought we knew about that character's origin. In reality, Captain America was simply altered by the Cosmic Cube, and and the real version of him from the main continuity still existed within the cube or shards of the cube itself. He was technically changed by a version of the Cosmic Cube that was a person who was named Kobik, but anyways. <laughs> Peter himself actually also lost his company, Parker Industries, as a result of Hydra Cap's takeover. To keep his various offices around the globe from falling into Hydra's hands, Peter had to basically run them all into the ground, essentially destroying everything he had built. If that isn't a betrayal, I don't know what is. And it's Captain America. <gasps> Shocking, but not really, because it's Hydra Cap. Like I said, alternate reality. Whatever. Number nine, Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange is another hero who kinda accidentally, I suppose, betrayed Spider-Man. Well, in the comics, Strange recently saw Peter as his champion in a fight between Strange and Mephisto. In the MCU, Strange tried to help Peter out with the fact that he and his friends all seemingly got rejected from the colleges they'd applied to because of his identity being revealed to the world. Doctor Strange decided to use a spell that would make the world forget that Peter Parker was Spider-Man. Even though it was also against the new Sorcerer Supreme, Wong's wishes and his recommendations. Now, granted, Steven did mean to help Peter here, he wasn't like intentionally betraying him, but in the end, everything went kinda haywire, mainly due to Peter, who kept trying to change the parameters of the spell as Strange was mid-casting it. But this isn't really how Strange betrayed Peter anyways. It was more afterward when other villains from across the multiverse ended up appearing in the current reality, and Spider-Man wanted to try to help them as opposed to just banishing them after finding out they were all pretty much fated to die, which Strange had kind of seemingly known about, but just didn't really care about. Strange had told Peter to round them up, but withheld that important information about their fate, which to me was a pretty major betrayal. Like, these are people from the Spider-Verse, I feel like you should at least tell Peter what he's doing, and what kind of fate he's condemning these people to if he sends them back. And of course, this revelation only led to another betrayal in kind when Peter decided to release these villains, helping them escape Strange in an effort to actually fix them. What can I say? You betray someone and then they're probably gonna betray you back. That's how it goes. Number eight, Boomerang. Okay, okay, so Boomerang isn't really a hero. He's more of a villain than anything, but for a moment there, he was leaning in the direction of being a hero at least, and I think because of that, we can give him a spot on this list. Boomerang is known for being a member of the Sinister Syndicate and ended up getting roped into Sinister War. Before he was battling it out with all the other Sinister teams though, he was actually almost Peter and Spider-Man's ally and friend at one point. In fact, I would say he was Peter and Spider-Man's ally and friend, and roommate. Okay, so in reality, Boomerang was just using him to get help collecting pieces of a tablet that he wanted, but that's where the betrayal part comes in. When Fred Myers applied to be Peter Parker's roommate due to Myers' reputation, Parker really wasn't feeling it. He wasn't so sure, but he did decide ultimately to give Myers a chance after he kinda helped him out and kinda saved his life. And when he did, he was happily surprised. The two became friends, and Boomerang even showed promise as Spider-Man's ally and a potential hero in his own right. In the end, however, once the tablet was acquired, Boomerang revealed his true colors and admitted that this was kind of his plan the whole time. But he also admitted he did feel bad for betraying Spider-Man in a letter that he left him. Myers actually felt so bad, he ended up helping Spider-Man out at one point during Sinister War, helping him to hide from the others for a time. Aw, so cute. Also, I just really like this story, so I was like, I could talk about this on this list. <laughs> 
and I got excited and here we are. Number 7 Fantastic Four When Spider Man was just starting out, the Fantastic Four were among those to betray him. I know, shocking. Spider Man went to them looking for help supporting his Aunt May and himself. You see, back in those days, and mm, kind of in general with Spider Man and his comics, money was tight, and Spider Man was trying to find a way that he could use his talents and his abilities to help pay the bills. He was hoping to join the FF, who he assumed must have a salary wage as superheroes that would be reasonable in amount due to them, you know, saving the world all the time. Unfortunately, that was not the case. He broke into the Baxter building in an attempt to impress the family of amazing superheroes, only to find out that they were a nonprofit organization and they didn't really get paid to do what they did. And even if they had space on the team and could afford to pay Spidey, they claimed initially they wouldn't really want him. Ouch. Spider Man at the time was considered an outlaw by the press and police, and they didn't want to be affiliated with him even. Harsh. Of course, that's all water under the bridge now, and Spider Man has actually been a member of the FF's Future Foundation and is actually on the extended or backup roster for the Fantastic Four team. So it all worked out in the end, but in the early days, it was a pretty harsh betrayal. Number six, Morbius. Morbius and Spider-Man have had a complicated history. Sometimes they're allies, sometimes they're foes. Morbius himself also has had a complex history. Sometimes he's a hero, sometimes a villain, sometimes he's a little more somewhere in between those two. Case in point, when he resurfaced after seemingly being cured of his vampirism by a bolt of lightning. I kid you not, that is what happened in the comics. This stuck for quite a while, but eventually Morbius' hunger and his thirst for human blood returned. He attempted to reach out to a doctor at Empire State University for help, but instead ran into Spider-Man who didn't trust him. It turned out that he was in earnest trying to figure out what was going on and fix it, but the doctor he wanted help from turned out to be an ally of Hydra. She kidnapped Morbius, and when Spider-Man came to free him, things quickly went kind of crazy. Instead of teaming up with Spider-Man and showing gratitude for this rescue, Morbius attacked his captors, and then when Spider-Man intervened in that attack, attacked him instead, draining him of blood and inadvertently turning Spider-Man into a vampire-like creature himself for a while, who was known as Hunger. Also, I know there's gonna be people that are gonna be like, Amanda, Morbius does not want blood. He just wants plasma, Amanda. It's just all about the plasma. Look, the plasma's from the cartoon, okay guys? And they had to say plasma, because they couldn't say blood, because it's a kid's show. So fun fact. Although plasma is important as well. You can donate plasma, and you can donate blood. There's lots of cool things you can donate. You should check that out and go save someone's life today. This just became a PSA from Amanda McKnight. <laughs> can you tell that I donate blood? I feel like you can. <laughs> Number 5, Spider-Man. Although typically this hero is often known by the name Scarlet Spider. That is right, we are talking about the hero and Spider-Man clone, Ben Riley. Currently in the comics, Ben is the Spider-Man or a Spider-Man currently roaming New York City. He is the Spider-Man of choice by Corporation Beyond who is looking to get into the business of superheroes, apparently. They acquired the right to the Spider-Man name and as such, Ben actually asks or kind of more tells Peter that he can't be Spider-Man anymore, or at least he can't use that name. He does ask for his blessing as well out of respect. He's not trying to be a jerk here, but it's obvious that Peter is hurt by this revelation as he already seems to be suffering from a bit of like an identity crisis perhaps, which is also pretty interesting because I feel like so is Ben at this point. Number four, Wolverine. Oh boy, Wolverine and Spider-Man aren't always two heroes who see eye to eye. And we've seen them butt heads a few times, despite both being heroes and even at times teammates. I would say one of the things that has come up the most when it comes to Wolverine potentially betraying Peter has to do with one of his biggest love interests in the comics. Yep, we are talking about Mary Jane Watson. In the Ultimate Comics, the two heroes body swapped and Wolverine and Peter's body attempted to put some major moves on Mary Jane, and in the main continuity, Wolverine once insulted their relationship, causing Peter to throw him through the window of a building. A seemingly impenetrable, bulletproof window too. Just FYI. That is how upset Peter was about the remark. Number 3, Black Cat. Black Cat is another hero who has betrayed Peter in the past. And to those of you focusing on her more mm, criminal and villainous past, yes, Felicia Hardy is not a saint, but I would argue that now, currently in the comics, she is more a hero than a villain. Also, she recently just like worked with Captain America, and I feel like if you're doing that, 
you gotta be pretty good, right? Captain America doesn't really work with villains usually. I think at least we can give her an anti-hero status. She betrayed Spider years ago, but has also betrayed him more than once when she ended up going behind his back to get herself some superpowers. She did this because she knew Spider-Man was worried for her safety and she wanted to be able to keep up with him and help him, you know, to not worry about her. Unfortunately, she turned to Kingpin to get said powers and they ended up being bad luck probability based powers, so she really only ended up hurting Spider-Man a lot in the end. Especially when he kind of realized that something was up with her and that she was keeping secrets. Not a good look. Not a good look, Felicia. Number two, Spider-Man. What is worse than having your lover betray you? How about you betraying yourself? Yes, I know we've already talked about Spider-Man on this list, but now we are here to talk about the other Spider-Man, the original Spider-Man, in comparison to his clones at least, Peter Parker. Peter might do everything he can to save the world and make New York a safer place, but at the end of the day, there is one enemy he really can't defeat himself. After all, Spider-Man is probably one of the most guilt-ridden superheroes of all time, always feeling like he is responsible for the death of those that he loves. He doesn't just feel as though he's betrayed himself and those he cares about as a hero, but he also therefore betrays and often sabotages his own happiness because of this, believing sometimes that he doesn't actually even deserve to be happy. It's pretty tragic stuff. Also, it's not always your fault, Peter. Sometimes bad things just happen, you know? Like, you can't control everything in life. You just gotta accept it. Peter needs more therapy. That's what I think. Number one, Iron Man. Iron Man is probably one of the characters most well known for betraying Spider-Man on this list, even though what he did to actually betray him is somewhat debatable in terms of it being considered, you know, like a one for one betrayal. Iron Man encouraged Peter to join him and support the Superhero Registration Act. Spider-Man happened to be such a big fan and friend of Tony's that he agreed to do so and even unmasked for Tony Stark during a televised public statement. However, later on, this would come back to bite Peter in the butt but when he and his family ended up being targeted by criminals who wanted Spider-Man dead. Surprise, surprise. Aunt May ended up in the hospital as a result of a targeted attack, and eventually this whole debacle would also lead to Spider-Man losing his marriage to Mary Jane when the pair made a deal with Mephisto in order to save Aunt May's life. There is even a what if focused around what would happen if Mary Jane was the one to be killed, where Peter specifically blames Iron Man for basically everything bad that has happened to him up till this point. Well, not everything, but everything surrounding this. Also, he realized what was gonna go on with Iron Man wanting to use like the negative zone kind of as like a prison, found out that, and then he was like, I'm really not about this. And then even then, they chased Spider-Man down. Although I believe Iron Man was kind of like, guys, let's just talk to Spider-Man. Let's not be weird about this. But at that point, it was too late. Iron Man really had no control and had gotten, it gotten out of hand. That's what had happened. Civil War One, baby. Number 10, Spider-Woman. This betrayal is a little more subtle, but it definitely led to some trouble for both characters down the line. So I think it's an important one to mention still. Jessica Drew was in Madripoor with her friend Lindsay and Patch, AKA Wolverine. She knew he was Wolverine and he knew she knew at this point, I believe, but he still went by the alias of Patch because Logan thought he was being oh so sneaky and he didn't want the world to know that the X-Men were actually alive at the time. Even though I feel like anyone that met Patch probably knew it was Wolverine. Jessica had decided to take up a job as the Prince of Madripoor, Prince Baran's bodyguard, but Patch thought it was a bad idea because Baran was a bad guy. At the same time, Jessica was giving Patch grief for working his muscle and getting involved with Tiger Tiger, a powerful crime boss in Madripoor. Both felt the other was betraying their own sense of morals and thereby betraying their friendship. So it was kind of a two-way betrayal in these characters' eyes. In the end, Patch was right to criticize Prince Baran as Jessica ended up near death after stumbling upon the Lazarus Project during her shift in the palace and barely escaping with her life. Patch likewise would have a trial ahead as he wrestled with the mysterious Lazarus project, but he'd forgive Jessica when he found her and help her to get to safety and get much needed medical attention. She was pretty messed up. Don't you hate when that happens? Don't you hate when you stumble upon mysterious projects and then you just get like thrown into a sewer because you're like in such a terrible condition? 
I know I do. Number nine, Gambit. In this case, Gambit wasn't entirely in control of himself. He was under the influence of the Shadow King, who had possessed him and made him fight against Logan. Wolverine happened to be the one to face off with him. He managed to get the drop on Gambit, defeating him in battle when Wolverine successfully pinned him down. This all happened too after Wolverine had been cut off from the rest of those X-Men who were not influenced by Shadow King. But as Wolverine said, while Gambit was busy throwing insults his way, he is one of the best when it comes to winning fights. And regardless of being cut off from support, that is exactly what happened here. Number 8. Wolverine Laura Kinney, formerly known as X-23, and Logan have quite the complex past. Laura is basically a genetic female counterpart to Wolverine. Some consider her a clone, and some consider her more a genetic offspring. Kind of like Logan's daughter. In reality, she's, well, she's kind of both, to be honest. When Logan first came across Laura, he realized that she had been brainwashed and wasn't in control of her actions. Able to sympathize, he did his best to free her. She was supposed to go straight to the X-Men, basically, but decided to venture out on her own instead, which resulted in her getting in a fight again with Logan next time that he ran into her. However, he was able to not only defeat Laura this time, but also basically talk her down and bring her back with him to the Xavier Institute, helping her to find a home among the X-Men. And now the two are very close, and I don't think Laura would even consider fighting Logan again unless she had, like, absolutely no other choice, like if he turned evil or some such thing. But then honestly, she wouldn't be betraying him really because the Logan she knew would probably like want her to take him out. I feel like he's also the type of guy that's kind of like, you know, I've lived a long life, like I'm kind of fine, but I guess I gotta keep living, bub. Number seven, Kitty Pride. Kitty Pride didn't intend to betray Wolverine. It wasn't really her choice at all. She was brainwashed into doing it by Wolverine's longtime rival and old teacher, Ogun. Ogun was looking to get revenge on Wolverine and so psychically uploaded a bunch of awesome ninja and martial arts skills to Kitty Pride's mind and then sent her to assassinate her mentor, friend, and fellow X-Men, Wolverine. Marine. Fortunately, the bond between Logan and Kate was so strong that they were able to work together to defeat Ogun in the end, freeing Kitty but leaving her with an experience which had changed her forever. She returned to X-Men a little more mature and definitely more of a badass. I think she still has all of that like assassin knowledge in her brain as well, taking up the new name for herself for a time at least of Shadowcat. Yeah, it was really more Ogun than Kitty betraying, but even if she was being controlled, it was still her own physical form fighting against Wolverine. And this is a cool story that I just enjoy revisiting. So I saw an opportunity to put it on this list and I was like, I'm gonna do it. So I hope you enjoyed it. Number six, Mariko. Mariko Yoshida was one of the major loves of Wolverine's life. The two were even engaged to be married, but Mariko being the good person that she was, wanted to make sure that her family no longer had any criminal ties before the wedding happened, as she was now the head of Clan Yoshida. Unfortunately, before they could get married, Mariko died during her attempt to broker peace between the rival criminal gangs. She ended up going to hell and would later meet Wolverine there when he was sent to hell by the right red hand. Or at least his soul was sent there. His physical form was still on earth, but it's a whole story. While his soul was there, his suffering would manifest in him being tormented by Mariko, his former love. She didn't want to torment Wolverine, but she pretty much had no choice. Despite this, Wolverine, when he escaped, came back and tried to free her, but Mariko believed she deserved what she got and chose to stay in hell, refusing to let him save her. I think she felt pretty bad because she was like, I feel like I betrayed you, and also I got stuff to atone for, you know? Number five, Scarlet Witch. As much as I hate to include someone like Wanda on this list, it kind of has to be mentioned that she technically betrayed all of mutant kind with Decimation and M-Day. Of course, I will still argue that this really only happened because Wanda's mental health was often shafted in her past, and so her kind of snapping after House of M made a whole lot of sense. While Wolverine was still Wolverine, there were a lot of mutants, and I mean a lot, that were affected. The whole community felt this blow, and Wolverine was part of that community, so even though he still had his powers, he was still hurting a lot, I think. I think a lot of mutants were. Also, he was one of the first people to realize what had happened in the House of M reality, and he was not too happy to have a fabricated life made for him and be denied the reality and history that were true to him, no matter how bleak or painful in comparison to the world Wanda had made for him and everyone in an effort to try to make herself, her family, and pretty much all other supers happy. I love how Wanda's like, I just want to give everyone a reality where like we can all be happy, you know? And everyone's like, how dare you? How dare you try to make me happy? <laughs> Obviously, I feel very bad for Wanda. I think you can tell. <laughs>
Number four, Professor X. Oh, bub, bub, bub. Professor X, for being the head of the Xavier Institute and for being a leader among his own X Men team, who claims to stand for mutant and human harmony and preaches about what it means to be good and be a hero and fight for all of humanity united has a lot, and I mean a lot, of skeletons in his closet. He has betrayed the X-Men multiple times, Wolverine included. I think mainly this has to do with Professor X choosing to suppress, as opposed to acknowledge and deal with, his darker side. He put his team in danger when it was revealed that Danger Room was actually sentient, and itself a living AI mutant who then pursued the team in an effort to get to Xavier. And also technically came equipped with knowledge on all their weaknesses, by the way. Danger Room is scary. Or just danger, sorry. Just danger, that's what the mutant version of Danger Room is called. Additionally, Xavier's repressed negative emotions and his severe punishment of Magneto was what led to the creation of the psychic entity known as Onslaught, which was sort of a blend between those two psyches. You could also argue that even in modern comics, Wolverine has felt betrayed by Professor X. When X chose to allow all mutant villains to come to Krakoa and call it their home, Wolverine was one of the few people to protest, thinking it was a bad idea that would inevitably backfire. I guess we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Although I feel like based on Inferno, Wolverine may have been right here. Number three, Hulk. The Hulk has always been a rival of Wolverine's, despite the fact that both of them are heroes. In fact, Wolverine made his first appearance in Incredible Hulk issue 180, where he fought against him. Hulk has dropped in to fight Wolverine a few times in the comics, and sometimes does so just to prove that I guess he's the strongest between them. Although it doesn't always end that way. In fact, quite a few times their fights have actually ended more in a tie than anything. Some of Hulk's other personas, like Joe Fixit, have also gotten involved with Wolverine. And even when Fixit has meant well, there is an animosity between these two that generally leads to Fixit causing more trouble for Logan during their adventures. This is usually because they each have their own approach to dealing with problems and with baddies. Although, I guess, to be fair, it seems that the Hulk usually also feels betrayed, which is what leads to their fighting. But even the slightest thing can set him off, so these betrayals are usually just from some like small remark that Wolverine has made. So in the end, I always feel like Wolverine is more betrayed by the Hulk because He's just like said something offhand, and then the Hulk's like, now we have to fight. It's like, whoa. Breathe, it's okay. Number two, Magneto. Sure, sure, Magneto was a villain when this one happened, but he also joined up with the X-Men only to turn on them later, and vice versa, it's happened a lot. Magneto might, in general, be thought of as a villain because of his iconic classic appearances in the Fox X-Men films, as well as the X-Men 90s animated series and in the classic comics, but he's really more complex than just being a villain. In fact, currently in the comics, he's more of a hero, I'd say, however, that doesn't change his history with Wolverine, who is understandably a little less likely to trust former villains turned heroes because of history like this. Magneto is the one responsible for ripping the adamantium right out of Wolverine's skeleton back in the day, which was insanely painful and left Wolverine in a more feral state for a good long period in the comics. He also lost his nose because of this, and this all went down after Magneto had been acting more heroically in the comics, working with the X-Men on behalf of Charles Xavier in his absence. In fact, Magneto was like the leader of the X-Men then, so if you want to be like, but he's a villain, he was definitely a hero, and then he went back to being a villain. He felt like other people were betraying him. The tension between the two characters has remained ever since, and even shows up in the current X-Books, despite them both residing in harmony on Krakoa. Magneto only ranks a little lower here because he is so iconically a villain in many folks' minds still. But to me, he's a hero. Number one, Cyclops. Cyclops has betrayed Wolverine multiple times in the comics. Probably one of the biggest betrayals happened, either when the two couldn't agree and so created their own X-Men teams separate from one another, each believing their view on young mutants and how to train and teach them was superior, or when Cyclops recruited Wolverine's female clone slash genetic daughter onto the Black Ops mutant team, X-Force, against his wishes. Flora, aka X-23, aka now Wolverine, had just recently escaped those who saw her only as a weapon and a tool to be used, a deadly killing machine, which was exactly why Wolverine did not want her on the X-Force team. But Cyclops saw how useful she could be and felt that if she was willing to join, then it didn't really matter what Logan thought. Wolverine evidently disagreed with his outlook. 
He disagreed quite strongly. Number 10, Iron Man 2099. One of the Iron Man 2099s anyways. This one comes from the 2099 future of the Iron Man Armored Adventure series. Here 2099 Iron Man is a hero named Andros Stark who is also Tony Stark's grandson but becomes an antagonist in the series. All because he travels back in time to defeat his grandfather Tony Stark. However this is because Andros believes Tony is to blame for creating the AI menace known as Vortex in his time. He attempts to kill Tony and the Avengers, but later realizes when they aim to use a virus to defeat him that this nanotech virus is actually Vortex, and that Vortex therefore only existed in true timey-wimey paradoxical fashion because it was created to defeat him, Iron Man 2099. In other words, Andros and his attempt to stop Vortex was also the cause of Vortex's existence. Man. What a time travel story. I feel like time travel and Tony Stark go together just like bread and butter. This is just always a thing that happens. Number nine, Iron Lad. Iron Lad probably didn't mean to betray Iron Man back when he was known as Iron Lad, but the reality is he was destined to do so. This is because Iron Lad goes on to become the famous Avengers villain, Kang the Conqueror, along the way also becoming Immortus and using his power to, at that time, manipulate and influence Iron Man to get him to do his bidding to help him direct events in a certain way. Kang slash Immortus are generally all about manipulating the timeline so that they can achieve their own goals in the future. They're like, I'm gonna set everything in motion, then I'm gonna go to the future, and then like everything will be great for me, for me Kang, or for me Immortus. And unfortunately, Immortus's machinations this time around caused Iron Man to be pulled into his plot and eventually turned into Immortus' own sleeper agent, making Iron Man turn on his friends and then become a villain. Boo. And like I said, Kang and Immortus are technically Iron Lad, so technically a hero, at least to start with. Number eight, Hulk. I personally kind of think Hulk was actually like kind of justified in this one, but you could consider it betrayal just based on the fact that Tony was, you know, pretty much just trying to apologize and atone for his past, and Hulk wanted, well, pretty much wanted none of it. This spun out of original sin when it was revealed that an inebriated Tony, back when he was an alcoholic, was responsible for an accident in essence that transformed Bruce Banner and created Hulk. He had tampered with the Gamma Bomb and had also pushed for more deadly weaponry against Bruce's wishes. However, the version of Tony that we had in the present day had been mentally reset. So despite being post superior Iron Man here, he was back to being a good guy and basically just felt awful about this whole thing and about all of the bad stuff he'd done in the past. But despite this, Hulk still wanted to end his life and was unwilling to talk it out, which you know, isn't really fair considering that Tony was like, look, I know I messed up, but can we just be friends? Oh, poor Tony. Everyone always wants to kill him. It's just, it's a rough go. Number seven, Ant-Man. Hank Pym has done a few things to betray a good amount of the Avengers, but this time around, we're actually talking about a version of him that merged with Ultron. I think it's called Ultron Pym is what we usually call this version of Ultron, fun fact. I'm calling it Ant-Man though because it's a hero's list, but Ultron Pym I think is the general name. Hank and Ultron had united to become one being which ended up messing them both up, as you'd imagine, in Ultron agenda. Tony at the time was dating Janet Van Dyne and Ultron Hank, or you know, Ultron Pym, did not like this. His plan was to fix the world by turning everyone on it into a sort of organic and AI merged being and wanted Janet to basically merge with Jocasta and act as his partner and in essence part organic, part AI, robo-esque bride. Because Tony was with her, this pretty much infuriated him and so the two faced off with Ultron Hank trying to kill Tony because of his relationship with the Wasp. What a weird story. <laughs> So many weird stories. Number six, Eric Killmonger. Eric Killmonger isn't really so much a hero in the main continuity, and in the end, he didn't end up being so much a hero in this reality either, but he did pose as one for a good amount of time and was a member of the Guardians of the Universe. Although he did try to betray them as well, having his own objectives. So, important to note. Killmonger became Iron Man's right hand man in the Disney Plus streaming series What If, in the episode titled What If Killmonger Rescued Tony Stark? Stark. What would have happened? Well, Killmonger would have pretended to be a friend of Tony Stark only to later betray him and 
kill him in cold blood. One, because he pretty much hated everything that Tony represented, but two, because Tony's death was kind of all part of a plot to try and provoke a war between the US and Wakanda so that he himself could defect to the side of Wakanda and thereby take over the nation from within using Stark's technology to win Wakanda's favor when he helps them to defeat the US. It's a pretty bad betrayal though, it's pretty like, it's pretty tragic, like I was like man, wow, that's crazy. That whole episode was crazy. I hope we get to see more of it. Number five, Iron Man 2020. Iron Man 2020 is Arno Stark's Iron Man. In the comics, he just went by Iron Man, but editorial wise, he was referred to as Iron Man 2020, just to make it more clear that, you know, this isn't Tony Stark Iron Man. And also because that was actually the name of the series that he was a part of. Arno Stark, by the way, is Tony's brother and was the natural born son of Maria and Howard Stark. Whereas it was revealed that Tony himself was adopted. Arno was hidden away for his own protection and also was not able to roam freely in the world due to him being born, requiring medical assistance to breathe. In the end, Tony would learn the truth of his being adopted and about the existence of his brother. The two would team up for a time, but when Arno took up the mantle of Iron Man and combated against an AI rebellion, in the end, he believed the best way to protect humanity was to control all the AI and the humans with his submission code. But when he asked his brother Tony to join, him, Tony saw that Arno pretty much needed to be stopped, as he'd become a danger to the world and its free will. I just feel I just feel bad for Arno, man. Can we bring Arno back yet? Is Arno doing anything right now? I don't think Arno is doing anything. I feel like he's still in his bubble. Still in his bubble, and I think he's like going to die soon, which is why we're keeping him in a bubble. Number four, Captain America. Captain America had his reasons, and honestly, I was on his side of the war. But the amazing thing about Civil War I was that the two sides each had their own seemingly justifiable motivations for their actions. So although I was on Cap's side, I could understand how fans on Tony's side would see Cap as a traitor of Iron Man instead of the other way around. Iron Man was fighting on the side of the Superhuman Registration Act, believing that making superhumans register so they could be monitored and deployed, working within government oversight for the safety of civilians was the better way to go. Captain America was against the SRA, which put these two at odds, and which Iron Man and fans of Iron Man would likely consider to be a betrayal, considering that Tony thought he knew the better way to protect people. In the end, I would say it turned out that Cap was right, but you know, we each have our own sides of that argument that we believe in. Number three, Iron Man. That's right, Iron Man betrayed Iron Man. Are you surprised? It's already happened twice on this list. It's gonna happen again. In fact, that happens kind of multiple times in the comics and in narratives. It is kind of a thing that I feel like comes up more than once. This time though, we are focusing on The Crossing, when Immortus turned Iron Man into a sleeper agent and villain, which we talked about a little bit earlier on the list. A young Iron Man was then brought to the present day to fight against his older version, and you could say there was some betrayal on both sides here. Older OG Iron Man had betrayed his younger self and his own ideals by allowing himself to become a pawn of Immortus though admittedly it wasn't really his fault, and younger Iron Man fought against older evil Iron Man, which was likely considered a betrayal in his eyes, cause you know, he's got his younger self fighting him, he's like that's not cool man. At least until older Iron Man almost killed his younger self, and then he ended up being redeemed in the end, sacrificing himself inevitably to save everyone else, and allowing the younger Tony to remain in the present day and take over for his older self. Oh the crossing, what a weird time you were. Even more odd, later down the line, these two Iron Men would actually be merged together, becoming the real Iron Man instead of two different versions of the character. And now we have reset Iron Man, who's, there's like stuff that he doesn't even remember from the past. Iron Man's had a weird, he's had a weird continuity. <laughs> Number two, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel and Iron Man used to be super close, but then Civil War II happened. They are over the events of Civil War II now in present day, but boy, did this initially muck up their friendship. After the success of Civil War I, Marvel thought a second Civil War was in order, but this time, the motives behind it they weren't quite as solid. <laughs> Carol Danvers believed that the inhuman Ulysses visions of the future that might come to pass, and were somewhat unclear, should be acted on to protect humanity. Doesn't really make a lot of sense, but okay. In other words, Civil War II was 
Minority Report. Iron Man, being down this road before, tried to talk Carol out of this madness, but after Rhodey died when a prediction of Ulysses's came true, there was basically no stopping her. Kind of odd as well, as though Carol and Rhodey are often a couple in the comics, and I do ship them together, Iron Man is definitely one of those that is closest to Rhodey. And even with Rhodey's death, Iron Man still thought that Ulysses visions shouldn't be held in such high regard. So you'd really think that Carol might have you know, be more open to listening to him. Carol fought against Iron Man and a line was drawn. A very weird line that didn't really make a ton of sense, but hey, Civil War II everyone. It is what it is. It happened. Now we have to live with it. Number 1. Black Widow Black Widow majorly betrayed Iron Man in the Ultimate Universe, and sure, it's not main continuity, but it's it's honestly it's so bad, it needs to be acknowledged and mentioned, and that's why it took my top spot. In the Ultimate Universe, Black Widow was only posing as a hero, but was really, in secret, a villain the whole time. Simply pretending to defect, to get in with the heroes, and then betray them, and betray the United States. She was engaged to be married to Tony Stark, and ended up breaking off the engagement when she revealed her true colors. She attempted to steal Tony's fortune and tragically killed his loyal butler and his friend Jarvis as well. So sad. In the end, Tony was able to stop Black Widow because he had given her a suit of armor as an engagement gift, but made sure to still have control of the nanites that were in her blood because of his terrible track record with women. Too bad he wasn't able to save Jarvis though, it's pretty sad. Black Widow would get hers in the end, but Tony would feel the pain of this betrayal for quite a while thereafter. Bruce Wayne, Batman Beyond. How can Bruce Wayne betray himself? Well, unless we're speaking in a philosophical or psychological way, he can't. That's why this point is talking about Batman Beyond, which is Terry McGinnis. In Batman Beyond issue 31, 32, and 33, after visiting Arkham Asylum, Bruce Wayne begins to act rather strangely. He begins drinking at odd times, he doesn't seem to care when Terry is on the verge of death, with Terry's brother having to step in to save him, and he seems to go gambling and brags about his money a lot too, which is kind of strange. Most shocking of all though, he shoots at Terry when he's confronted and tackles him off a ledge. It turns out, it isn't actually Bruce Wayne, it's actually a doppelganger villain named Falseface, so it's all good, and I'm sure none of you are surprised. Jezebel Jett. In the Batman R.I.P. comic, the group known as the Black Glove started working in Gotham, and Bruce Wayne immediately smelt foul play. At a point during this conflict, his love interest at the time, Jezebel Jett, was revealed to be a double agent. Jezebel and the Black Glove even buried Batman alive. But Batman is one guy whose heart you don't want to mess with. He rises from the grave, revealing he was merely pretending to be in love with her too. Then he reveals her whole backstory, which he seemed to already know. She then left, vowing to get revenge on Bats, which seems a little backwards to me, before being killed by Talia al Ghul. The Crimson Knight Richard Lyons was a character that appeared in Detective Comics number 271. He was also known by the name Crimson Knight and was a vigilante in Gotham, gaining the trust of the GCPD as well as the heroic duo of Batman and Robin. Being the good guys though, they had a sneaking suspicion he may not have been on the up and up, and after confronting him after he tried to steal some valuables, it was revealed that he was actually Crime Lord Lyons. <gasps> and he was promptly captured and his career as both a hero and a villain were both ended. The Cavalier The Cavalier was a swashbuckling, sword-wielding hero who first appeared in Legends of the Dark Knight number 32. Batman was a big fan of the Cavalier, actually. He had such a positive outlook when fighting crime, and he was a man of gallantry and honor, and he reminded Bruce Wayne of his childhood, being very similar to Zorro, who Bruce Wayne was a fan of. Sadly, the Cavalier let Batman down when he started resorting to a life of crime when he realized just how much easier it was compared to fighting crime. So it's he's not so honorable after all it seems. The Justice League. There are actually multiple storylines involved here. Basically, in the Tower of Babel story, it's revealed that Batman has contingencies for every member of the Justice League in case anything were to go sour. When Ra's al Ghul gets his hands on these plans though, he uses them against the Justice League. Now, Batman is able to defeat Raish, but it causes the entire Justice League to lose a bit of trust in Batman. I just want to pause to say, this is kind of dumb. He's Batman. You think he wouldn't have a plan for scenarios like that? But hey, conflict sells. Either way, after the Joker ends up hitting the core members of the Justice League with Joker toxin in the Endgame storyline, they all turn on Batman. 
leading to a completely awesome moment where he takes them all on and comes out on top. Yeah, they were not in their right minds, but their actions were slightly fueled by the distrust caused by the event of the Tower of Babel. Catwoman, Dark Knight Rises. Now, if you haven't seen Dark Knight Rises yet, well then you clearly wouldn't care if I spoil a tiny little plot point. Batman makes a deal with Selina Kyle to give her a program called the Clean Slate that will eliminate her criminal past in exchange for her leading him to Bane. To be fair, she does lead Batman to the villain, only it's a trap and Bane beats the ever-living heck out of Bruce, breaking his back. She did it to save her own skin, but I just feel like if she put a little bit more faith in Bruce, maybe the movie would have ended way earlier. But I like how the rest of the story goes, so a betrayal that ultimately wasn't so bad, right? Flashpoint Batman. When the Flashpoint universe was created, it changed a lot of characters. Possibly one of the most interesting ones though, was Batman, who in this universe is actually Thomas Wayne, with Bruce being killed instead, and Martha Wayne becoming the Joker. It's twisted and cool. And this Batman has a different moral code, killing criminals. When he finds out that mainline Bruce Wayne becomes the Batman, he deems this unacceptable and tries to change his son's ways, instead of being, I don't know, a good father though, he teams up with Bane to break Bruce. Things get out of hand in the City of Bane event, which actually ended up with Thomas killing Alfred Pennyworth, which broke everyone. He very clearly regretted his actions, but I don't know man, you ain't coming back from that one. Not for me, sorry, you're done. Superman Dark Knights of Steel. I heavily regret not talking about this when we covered the top 10 new DC universes. Dark Knights of Steel takes place in a medieval fantasy version of the DC universe. It's super cool. The Wayne family used to rule over the land until Jor-El lands on Earth after escaping Krypton and they easily take over. Bruce and Kal-El are actually unknowing brothers, with Bruce being Jor-El's half-son. After a whole bunch of stuff happens that I won't tell you because you should read it, Bruce reveals the truth of his parentage to Cal, who stabs him in the chest with a shard of kryptonite. He then flies him up into the sky and throws him into the ground. Now, we don't know yet how the story is going to go from here on, or I don't know, but it definitely surprised me and I wanted you to all know so we can all follow along together. Ghostmaker. The Ghostmaker and Batman actually go back a long time, having met when they were both training to become vigilantes. They were easily friends. but. The difference between the two lay deeply in their core values and motivations. The motivation of Bruce's parents' death didn't sit well with Ghostmaker, and actually caused them to fall out. The Ghostmaker saw crime fighting as an art rather than a duty, and he lacked a sense of empathy that brought Bruce to classify him as a psychopath. They fought multiple different times and ultimately agreed that the Ghostmaker will stay far out of Gotham. That is, until Joker War, when he invaded Gotham, incapacitating Batman and the Bat Family, plus some other other heroes, and he tries to save Gotham. Yeah, that, that makes sense. DC vs Vampires. Alright, this one is hot off the presses. This year we got the DC vs Vampires storyline that I honestly, I didn't even know about it until making this video. Basically, the vampires are building themselves up to take on the world, turning many superheroes and supervillains into vampires. There's a mystery, however, surrounding who exactly the hero leader of the vampires could be. After testing all the members of the Bat Family, it's determined that none of them are vampires, so at least he has that. After some intense detective work and a whole lot of other stuff, that I don't want to spoil, the leader of the vampire army is finally revealed. Spoiler warning, okay? If you want to read this, turn off the video now. Okay? It's freaking Nightwing! Revealed as he plunges his fist straight through an unaware Batman's chest nonetheless. What? He had been consuming the blood of Starfire, which has the unique ability to make vampires immune to their natural weaknesses. I'm going to be staying tuned on how this story progresses, but Vampire Nightwing? Oh yes, oh yes, 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 yes. Number 10, Batman, sort of. Now I don't really consider what Batman did here to be a betrayal. In fact, if you know Batman, then you shouldn't be surprised that he had a list of protocols in place to take on his own allies in the Justice League. As this list proves, superheroes don't always stick within their altruistic sensibilities. Things happen, good guys go bad, people get mind controlled or possessed. This is comic books we're talking about for goodness sake. But. The problem comes when an incredibly capable villain named Rachel Ghoul gets his hands on Batman's list of ways to take down the Justice
Justice League. Then things get a little out of hand and it results in the JLA story of the Tower of Babel. Sure, the bad guy was stopped, but it didn't change the fact that the League held resentment over Batman for this. Number 9. Iska. Iska is a jerk. Plain and simple. A sore loser, some could say, except the problem is she never loses. It's literally her power. Almost like how Domino has the ability of luck, Iska has the ability to always win. And that even means she completely switches sides when her power tells her the side she's on is going to lose, which is just kind of super unfair. Number eight, Omni Man. This one isn't crazy unexpected since it happens pretty quickly in the story, but well, I watched the show before I read the comics and when Omni man turned around and brutally decimated the whole of the Guardians of the Globe, I sat there with my mouth wide open. It's possibly one of the biggest reasons I quickly ran and read the whole series. You see, Omni-Man is at first presented as the closest thing to Superman in the Invincible Universe. He is set up as the world's strongest hero, hailing from an empire of just human-like aliens called Viltrumites. And then, all of a sudden, the Viltrumites are the biggest threat to the universe being brutal and desperate conquerors with Omni-Man sent to Earth to judge the planet's viability as the new Viltrumite breeding ground and then take it over for the Empire. Unlike other Superman but bad characters, one of the central conflicts behind this story is the father-son relationship between Omni-Man and his son Mark, or Invincible. And the whole thing was just an awesome twist that you don't expect until it happens. Number 7, Icarus of the Eternals movie. This one came as a bit of a surprise for me. I read the Eternals comic as a kid and Icarus was the greatest among them. He was cool, if not a little basic, but he wasn't a traitor, so it was almost a pleasant surprise to see the MCU go the route of making him betray his fellow Eternals. I think it made the story just a bit more interesting. Basically, Icarus learned of his true purpose, to protect the human race to prepare for the birth of the Celestial growing inside the Earth. His fellow Eternals, including their leader Ajax, however, had grown attached to humanity and so Icarus made the decision to betray them, causing Ajax's death and trying to bring the successful birth of Tiamat the Celestial. It was an interesting change that some people may have liked and others may have hated, but it happened all the same. Number 6. Robot Going back to the Invincible series a bit more but way further down the line with the hero known as Robot. For most of the series, the super genius known as Robot had been a very helpful ally to Invincible and the world, and even when he flips to become the final antagonist of the comic, he still seems to be trying to help the world. Rudy here is a literal super genius, like I'm talking he invented a robotic cat that was super popular in Japan at the age of 3. Robot had an overarching plan that he was slowly working towards. All of his actions were were in service of his ultimate goal. He got himself a new cloned body, he got together with Monster Girl, he went off world with her, overthrew an empire and began ruling it, and eventually he took over the earth using his robotic drones, using them to do multiple tasks all at the same time, like talking to the Viltrumites, fighting the earth's superheroes, and meeting with the president. All for the greater good of the earth and the human species, creating a utopian society. He convinces a lot of people he's right too. Number 5. Terra of the Teen Titans the Judas Contract is definitely the most popular and definitive new Teen Titans story to date, and it includes a gutting betrayal that I would be remiss to not talk about. In New Teen Titans number 26, we are introduced to Tara Markov, who was a young girl who joined the team. Now it turns out that Tara had actually infiltrated the team following orders from none other than their nemesis, Deathstroke the Terminator. Tara being brainwashed dismantled the team from the inside, and it completely wrecked the Titans. She and Deathstroke were eventually foiled by intervention from Deathstroke's son, Jericho and Dick Grayson in his first outing as Nightwing, with Tara passing away at the story's conclusion, having brought down a building around herself in a blind rampage. The Titans still honor her with a statue and with the name being passed on to other heroes, but goodness gracious was this story fantastic and the betrayal deep and rooted. Number 4. Bishop Messiah Complex Bishop's betrayal of the X-Men during 2007's Messiah Complex revealed how far the time-displaced mutant is willing to go to change the future future for the better. Bishop comes from a dark future where mutants and humanity had eventually gone to war, and he eventually ended up trapped in the present. He became an X-Man and he served on a number of teams off and on over the years, even being Professor X's personal bodyguard, and he was just incredibly popular. After Decimation depowered almost all mutants on Earth, the birth of Hope Summers signaled hope for the mutants as she was the first mutant born since the Decimation, and she was an incredibly powerful one too. But Bishop 
Bishop's past came back to haunt him, convincing him that hope was the cause of the dark future that he lived in. He betrayed the X-Men and planned to take out Hope before she could grow up and change the world forever. He set off nano sentinels within the one sentinel squad, taking down the human pilots and pitting the sentinels against the X-Men. He then ambushed Forge in the chaos, laying a trap to capture Cable who was protecting Hope and end Hope's life. But by the end of the event, Bishop had to flee the X-Men after firing on Hope and instead accidentally striking and nearly killing Charles Xavier. Number 3 Cyclops During the Avengers vs X-Men event, Cyclops became a host for the Phoenix Force alongside four other mutants. Possessed by the Phoenix, Cyclops actually de-lifed Professor Xavier, which was a huge betrayal as for a long time Cyclops was Professor X's golden boy, and Professor X was like his father. As arrogant and manipulative as Charles Francis Xavier was, no one doubted his dedication to the cause or his love for his students, especially Scott. But his motivation for doing it was a bit more of just being a villain than anything else. But it was only Xavier whose life was lost, and he's died like eight times, so it's not the biggest loss in the world? Afterwards though, Cyclops adopted a more revolutionary attitude, leading a rebellious team of X-Men and creating some way more compelling X-Men stories to boot. Number 2 Hal Jordan Going with the theme of characters who are possessed or mind controlled to make them switch up their morals and ways of thinking, Hal Jordan's turn to the dark side is probably one of the most famous of those. Hal Jordan was probably the greatest Green Lantern, according to the comics at least, but in the 90s that changed. After the death of Superman and the subsequent reign of the Superman, Coast City, Hal Jordan's home, was destroyed. This completely changed the Lantern and he even tried using his power ring to try and revive the city, which was against the rules. When the guardians of the universe tried to stop him, he snapped. He went off the handle, ending the lives of every green lantern and snapping Sinestro's neck. Hal named himself Parallax and he became a threat to the whole DC universe for like a decade before sacrificing himself. Hal eventually did come back in 2004's Green Lantern Rebirth with Parallax being retconned as the primal entity of fear that was trapped in the central power battery and eventually corrupted Hal. And in it number one is Captain America in Secret Empire. To call this betrayal, the one within the Secret Empire storyline, controversial would be a bit of an understatement. The reveal of Captain America as a longtime Hydra agent completely took readers by surprise and even a bit of anger. His vast history of being the one to do the right thing suddenly meant very little. It even caused Marvel to be like, hold up, we were just kidding, he was manipulated by a cosmic cube, don't worry it's all good. So basically, what happened is that Steve Rogers revealed himself as a Hydra defector. He allied himself with a new Madame Hydra, took advantage of a global catastrophe to seize control of the world's governments, and helped Hydra make its move. Hydra, who had seriously infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D., began assuming control of key locations and executing any who stood in their way, including Cap personally taking out Rick Jones, a shot that left fans and characters alike reeling and shocked. It was not a great time, but it did lead to the awesome Hydra had infiltrated shield thing in the MCU's Winter Soldier movie. So not a complete loss. Making her first appearance, one of many appearances that is, back in Miss Marvel number 18 in 1978. Mystique aka Raven Darkholm, is a mutant shapeshifter who was actually ranked as IGN's greatest comic book villain of all time. For good reason, that is. Being able to mimic the look of just about anybody and known for being a master impersonator, you can only imagine the trouble that she has gotten herself into. She's also the mother of a few well-known characters in the Marvelverse, including Nightcrawler. Also, Nightcrawler may or may not be my dream role in a comic book movie. Really? Well, someone get Taylor some blue body paint and a tail, because I can totally see that one 100%. Bam. Oh, really? Thank you. That just uh, made my day. I had no idea you were going to say that. Oh, well, uh, no problem. It's not like you wrote this intro or anything, Taylor. Who knows? <laughs> now, the question is, which mutant do I consider to be my dream role? I'll have to think on that. That being said, here are top 10 shocking Mystique betrayals. Number 10, Mystique betrays Sabretooth. So, while Mystique and Sabretooth were on a mission to assassinate a scientist in East Berlin, Sabretooth thought he was completing the mission with Lenny Zauber. Lenny had already been dead by this point, so Mystique decided to sneak in there and take their place. Classic Mystique. So Mystique, aka not Lenny, 
finish the mission. And the pair laid low for a while in a safe location. They eventually became lovers. Ah, oh, how cute. Nothing gets you in the mood better than some assassinations. They ended up becoming lovers, but Mystique faked her own death to get out of there. I feel like faking your own death could work in a lot of situations. I mean, if you sleep in, running late from work, boom, just say you died, it's easy. So yeah, during this time with Sabretooth, they ended up giving birth to none other than Great and Creed. You would think being the son of two mutants, you would be riddled with powers. False. He had no power, so Mystique decided to eh, just abandon him. Naturally, Graydon grew up with some built up anger towards his parents. That ends up turning into hatred for all of mutants. So down the line, once he became a successful politician and leader of the Friends of Humanity organization, Graydon is assassinated by, you guessed it, Mystique. A time traveling version of her, that is in order to fix some time paradox. Number nine, Mystique betrays Rogue. I mean, there are a lot of times that Mystique has betrayed her adopted daughter. Although Mystique does seemingly betray Rogue, mostly in an attempt to protect her at least. One of the worst betrayals we've seen where Rogue ultimately decided to denounce Mystique as her adoptive mother was when Mystique, using the precognitive knowledge of Destiny's diaries, attempted to save Rogue's life. Sounds weird to consider this a betrayal, but hear me out. This was during Messiah Complex. Rogue had fallen into a coma, overwhelmed by all the consciousness and psyches in her mind, which she had absorbed using her powers. Mystique knew that Rogue would surely die if she didn't take action, but Destiny had prophesied a cure for their daughter. The touch of the baby mutant Messiah, who we now know as Hope Summers, would save her. Mystique stole the child and used it to awaken Rogue, but Rogue was pissed! Why? Because in using the child to awaken Rogue, Mystique had endangered its life as Rogue's powers could have potentially killed the baby. Now, they didn't, but she was still pretty livid, calling Mystique selfish and touching her with her own hands out of anger at her adoptive mother to punish her. She drained Mystique's powers and her consciousness and nearly killed Mystique in the process. Side note, don't piss off Rogue. Number eight, Mystique betrays Wolverine. We go back, way back. I'm talking to Wolverine volume three, issue 65. Five, that is. So it's 1921 Kansas City. Mystique and Logan are hiding from the police. And while they tried and kill everybody who was part of Mystique's gang, but until this point, they all thought that Mystique had sold them out. That's important. It was later revealed that Logan had actually spilled the beans the whole time. So Mystique ended up still getting away because, well, she's Mystique. Cut to Logan sitting on a train alone, or so he thought. Then he looks over and sees that Mystique is there with him. Sorry, what? She then reveals that she knew everything all along, including the fact that it was Logan who had tipped off the police. She then kicks Logan, she then kicks Logan off the train, bam, surprise, now you're walking. And she even praises Logan, saying, believe it or not, I'm not even angry with you. You made a smart play selling us out. I can't fault you for that. Followed by a let's bygones be bygones talk, what do you say? And then she decides just to hoof him off the train in the snow. Ouch, that's just cool. Literally, cool. Number seven, Mystique betrays the X-Men. This time around, Mystique betrayed the X-Men in a very roundabout way, and it's unclear whether this was an intentional betrayal or simply something that happened because Mystique was possibly in love with one of her rivals. In 2013's Uncanny X-Men issue 24, it was revealed that Mystique had actually married none other than Charles Xavier. We found out following Charles' death in Avengers vs. X-Men, when She-Hulk came, presumably as his lawyer, to read out his last will and testament, and handle the affairs of his estate. Of course, the X-Men were shocked to hear Xavier and Raven Darkholm, aka Mystique, had married in secret. We also knew at this point that Raven had bore Xavier a child, but even more shocking, Xavier left his school to her. In effect, she kind of got Xavier to betray his own X-Men, leaving the school to her instead of them. Later on, this marriage and this draft of the will would be seemingly erased from existence when Matthew Malloy, revealed to be secretly the most powerful mutant alive, had to be wiped from the timeline. Number six. Mystique betrays Mr. Sinister. So while Mystique was with the Marauders during the hunt for Hope Summers, Hope was the first new mutant born since M-Day, so it was kind of a big deal. Mystique was working with Gambit, who at the time had plenty of reasons to go after Mr. Sinister. Mystique ended up pushing Mr. Sinister against Rogue, and with Rogue's killing touch, did just the trick with skin-to-skin -skin contact. Rogue at this point was even tired of Mystique's manipulation. She even tried to kill Mystique herself with her touch, but Rogue ended up discovering that this baby actually had given Rogue her full powers back, eliminating the strain 88 virus. In doing so, she absorbed the memories of, you guessed it, Mystique. And once that happened, she told Gambit that she just needed to be left alone, she needs a minute, and she walked away. Mystique betrays Wolverine, again. 
There have been a few times this has happened as well, as you've already seen in this list. However, I'd like to focus on the one where Mystique helped send Wolverine to hell, working with the Red Right Hand, an organization who literally was bound together by the hate they all shared for Wolverine. That's some bonding right there. Mystique took the form of Melita Garner, one of Wolverine's lovers. Under this guise, she was able to lure him into the center of a ritualistic circle, created for the sole purpose of separating the target's soul from their body. Logan's soul was ripped asunder and sent to hell, while his body stayed on Earth and became possessed by a demon and wreaked all kinds of havoc. Mystique would later on attempt to make things right with Wolverine, warning him of the red right hand after helping to bring him back from hell. But he wasn't having any of it and refused to trust, forgive, or even listen to Mystique. Number four, Mystique betrays Deadpool. So in Deadpool issue 27, Mystique and the Merc with the Mouth were actually married, believe it or not. We start off with Deadpool asking her to sign divorce papers. And I know what you're thinking, wait, the two of them didn't work out? Oh, get out of town. Not really. In fact, Mystique was really just cuddling up to Wade Wilson simply just to get closer to the Weapon X program. Not a bad move. She was just using him as a way in so that she could eventually steal the files. Not cool. I mean, Deadpool actually got married a handful of times, as we all know, so don't worry. I don't think this broke his heart too, too much. Number three, Mystique betrays Rogue and Gambit. While Mystique and Gambit have worked together during their time with Mr. Sinister and both love and care about Rogue, Mystique hasn't always approved of her daughter's choice to be with him. In fact, at one point, she even tried to break up this epic longtime couple. Disguising herself as the mutant student, Fox, she attempted to prove that Gambit was not right for her daughter by trying to seduce him in the showers. Gambit refused her advances, insisting he loved Rogue. The two had been experiencing some strain due to the lack of physical intimacy in their relationship and were going through sort of psychic couples counseling sessions with Emma Frost. And you could tell that Gambit, well, steadfast in his love for Rogue, was definitely physically tempted. Turns the shower to cold. Number two, Mystique betrays the X-Force. So after Mystique had joined the new brotherhood of evil mutants, they had this plan. The plan was to expose and destroy X-Force. And while they were at it, claim Genesis as their own version of Apocalypse. So she disguised herself as Psylocke so she could properly seduce Phantom X. Cool. But she was exposed and it ended up causing this big fight. Not cool. Mystique ended up telling Phantom X about the toxin she used to poison him. And she said that somebody was after Psylocke, similarly how she's after him. So he left, you got out of there. So after her and the rest of the Brotherhood watched Ultimaton explode and kill the X-Force, she actually had her own secret plan to use Evan to kill the Shadow King, thus claiming the leadership of the Brotherhood. But what she didn't know was that X-Force was still bumping and tricked her into leaving the base. Nice, a lot of trickery going on in this one. Check out Uncanny X-Force issue 31 and see for yourself. You don't wanna miss it. Number one, Mystique betrays Nightcrawler. We know that Mystique was Nightcrawler's mother and that while married, she had an affair with his demonic father, Azazel, in order to conceive him. When he was born, however, the strain of giving birth caused her to lose control of her shape-shifting skills, revealing to the humans that attended her her true colors, so to speak. Learning that their lady was a mutant, an angry mob chased after her and her baby, who was also born looking like a blue little demon. During her escape, she chucked her newly born baby over a waterfall so it would be easier for her to disguise herself and get away. Fortunately, the baby that would become Kurt Wagner teleported himself to safety. Yeah, the betrayal in this mother-son relationship started real early. Number 10, Iron Man almost kills Tony Stark. Iron Man is really good at making suits, sometimes too good. At one point, he decided to make an AI suit instead of an AI to be used in his suit. This artificially intelligent suit did what most artificial robotic intelligences do. It almost immediately became evil. Although Tony did also decide to use some Ultron code to construct it, which honestly probably was not such a good idea, especially for someone who is supposed to be a computer genius. In the end, the suit created programming that allowed it to feel emotions, and after fighting with Tony Stark and trying to get him to forcibly merge with itself, it eventually felt remorse at its action while during their fight, Stark suffered a heart attack. The suit sacrificed its own life, giving Stark an emergency and what looks like terrifying artificial heart transplant. Like, you can still see the artificial heart sticking out of Tony's chest. That. That does not look sanitary to me. Number nine, the Avengers kill Iron Man. Okay, okay, so the Avengers weren't solely responsible for his death this time around, but they definitely were the ones who caused it to happen. Nah. 
at least in part. During the events of Armor Wars, Iron Man became branded a criminal by the United States government. Among those opposing the vigilante were fellow Avenger Captain America. This however happened at a time where Tony Stark was not known to be Iron Man. His identity remained a secret, and Stark simply claimed that the man in the suit was actually his bodyguard, often remote controlling the suit to kind of make it appear as though they were in the same place at the same time, so no one would question his explanation of the identity for Iron Man. In the end, Stark decided because of being declared an outlaw to kill Iron Man, claiming that the man in the suit was named Randall Pierce, and staging Pierce's death by allowing an empty remote controlled piloted suit to be destroyed during a confrontation with the government. This would later allow Tony to reveal himself as Iron Man, though he would at first claim another employee of his had simply taken up the mantle. But we knew the truth. It was really Tony in that suit. Once again. Number 8. Zombie Hulk Kills Zombie Iron Man during the events of Marvel Zombies, pretty much almost all of the zombified heroes meet their end at one point or another, save for a lucky or I guess unlucky few. Iron Man is not one of the zombified heroes who makes it, however. He is one of the victims of Zombie Hulk, who kills a bunch of other zombies when they start getting angry with him for, well, for eating so much, as they fear their food supply of brains and meat is running low. Zombie Hulk crushes Zombie Iron Man to the point that blood sprays out of his mouth and eye holes of his armor. Basically, he squishes him like a grape. Number 7. Tony Stark Sacrifices Tony Stark In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it was Tony himself who killed Tony. Or while well, he chose to sacrifice himself in order to ensure the events of Thanos' snap at the end of Infinity War, which initially wiped out 50% of all living beings at random, including half the population on planet Earth, remained reversed. So unsnapped, if you will. In order to bring everyone back, the heroes needed to time travel to retrieve the infinity stones and use them to create their own infinity stone gauntlet. Then the question came of, you know, who was going to wield it? The Hulk was the one to bring back everyone using the gauntlet, but Thanos from the past returned to threaten the heroic plans of the Avengers. He attempted to guarantee that his future self's plot, and really his own plot, remained successful. But Tony managed to get rid of him, wielding the gauntlet himself and using it to wipe out Thanos and his army with his own snap. Unfortunately, because Tony Stark is just a man at the end of the day, the amount of energy this required ended up killing him, despite him wearing his Iron Man armor at the time. Number 6. Dark Avengers Kill Tony Stark's Evil Brain In issue 190 of the Dark Avengers, we get a glimpse into the pocket reality of Earth 13584, where New York is one of the last vestiges of human civilization that various superhero factions fight for power over. One such faction is led by an evil Iron Man who is now just a brain. His arm Armor was crushed by a giant Janet Van Dyne of the same pocket dimension reality. As his brain ejected from the armor, trick shot of the Dark Avengers, Barney Barton, Clint's brother, shot the brain with an arrow, killing this alternate version of Tony Stark. Number 5. Captain America Kills Steel Corpse In an alternate reality belonging to Age of X, Tony Stark became consumed by a virus which fused him with his suit, causing him to slowly be digested by it. Ew. Formerly known as Iron Man, Tony adopted the mantle of steel corpse following this, which he thought was more appropriate considering, well, he was basically just a corpse in an armor. He joined the Avengers team in their mission to exterminate mutants, but when they decided to rebel against their mission directive, saving mutants instead, an emergency override system caused Stark to be unable to follow suit with the rest of his teammates. Stark told Captain America to save the mutants they were targeting, which he knew meant that Cap would be forced to kill him. Number 4. Captain Marvel Kills Tony Stark during the events of Civil War II, we saw Tony Stark's Iron Man and Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel butt heads over what the best decision would be when it came to using or not using the inhuman Ulysses' future vision. This all happened after Carol had been attempting to fight Thanos, whom Ulysses had predicted would return, and during the fight, Rhodey, aka War Machine, was killed. Carol was for using Ulysses' visions to prevent possible catastrophic events, whereas Tony was against punishing or arresting people based solely on Ulysses' visions, which he thought might be flawed. The Civil War ended with Carol seemingly killing Tony, though it was later revealed he was still alive, but in a coma, and then of course later on he woke back up, and he would actually even come to forgive Captain Marvel. And now they don't really talk about the fact that that all happened. 
Number 3. Steve Rogers Kills Superior Iron Man During the events of Time Runs Out, as a final incursion threatened the very existence of the entire planet and universe, Superior Iron Man and Old Steve Rogers came to blows. They were fighting about the controversial actions of the one secret organization of brilliant minds known as the Illuminati. Also, Superior Iron Man is just kind of a jerk, so it makes sense that Captain America would be like, I'm gonna fight you, you're evil. Captain America had declared Iron Man and the Illuminati enemies due to their their actions and as such, the two heroes and former friends had come to blows over the argument. Just as the world was about to end, these two fought each other to death, both being taken out by a helicarrier during their fight in their last moments before everything reset. And then Battle World happened. Woo! Number 2. Young Tony Stark Kills Older Tony Stark During the events of The Crossing, a wildly crazy story, it is revealed that Tony was a sleeper agent for Kang the Conqueror, who he later found out was actually a Mortis in disguise, posing as Kang. Evil older Tony kills tons of people before the Avengers attempt to stop him by bringing back a younger version of himself from the past who they hope can help to stop their Tony. This didn't quite work out as they planned, but in the end, older Tony and fake Kang were defeated when when older Tony, inspired by younger Tony, decided to sacrifice himself, switching back to the side of the heroes right before he died. With older Tony dead, it was decided that younger Tony would stay in the future and take his place. Number 1. Tony Stark Kills Immoral Tony Stark A crazy turn of events came about that led young Tony Stark to effectively make himself brain dead in the comics in the Invincible No More story. Following Secret Invasion, Norman Osborn created Hammer in the place of S.H.I.E.L.D. and created his own event Avengers, which we know as the Dark Avengers, mainly comprised of villains who adopted heroic personas to mirror that of the original Avengers team. To prevent Osborn from getting a hold of information that was gathered from heroes during the events of the first Civil War as part of the Superhuman Registration Act, Stark transferred the files from S.H.I.E.L.D. computers to his own brain, and then later wiped his own mind completely, making him brain dead. Tony would later return, but not really as the same version of himself. This Tony Stark would not have the knowledge of his actions during the first civil war. How convenient.